Let's open in prayer. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, which has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, before I start, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about when I was a teenager and went to a, a church, First Baptist Church of Cape Coral. And they had a tradition there that once a year they had a thing called Youth Sunday, where the youth ran everything, like all of it, offertory, music, you know, ushering, and even the preaching. They handed it over to a teenager. Uh, once a year, and uh, this, I don't remember any of them except for one. Uh, I remember this kid named James. Uh, James, uh, his task was to preach, and these, these are not homilies. These are sermons for like 30, 45 minutes. They're long, right? And he preached the entire 45 minutes on the job. Um, <laughs> yeah, everything was fine. Uh, Great, good, a job, 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 and everyone is just sitting there like, Can someone please get a word in that kid. It's a joke. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but no, so we all we all tried to stop. So I, I say that he did it in the integrity of his heart. I mean, he just didn't know, I guess. So I say that because last week um, when I was when I was talking, evidently when I was talking about the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, I think I flip flopped them. Ham's first, not Jacob. Um, in my defense, though, I don't even get my own children's names correct. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, that's my mea culpa. It's because he has a baseball team. So, um, man, John. <laughs> so uh, we are going to talk about John. We're going to take a break from Genesis. We'll finish Genesis next week. Um, we're a good piece of the way, if you're, if you're doing your daily reading, we're a good piece of the way in Job, and so I figured that this is, this is a good Sunday. Uh, we're not finished with it, so maybe this will help you look at it differently, I hope. Uh, so just a couple things before we even get into what is in the book. Why Job? Why Job and Genesis together? Why are we reading these at the same time? They're not bookends, you know, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We go pretty far down the way before we get to Job. Um, it is probably because Job is very old. Um, we're not sure who wrote it or when, not 100% sure. Some say Moses, but that's kind of a guess. I don't know if there's any uh, better scholarship on that. I'm just not really sure. Um, whoever wrote it and whenever they wrote it, the uh, time that it takes place in is probably around the time of Abraham. Uh, we know that for a couple of reasons. Um, that would put it about 4,000 years ago, right in the Bronze Age. So this is really far back. Um, the Bronze Age has is, is, uh, seen revolutionary things like farming starting to happen widespread. Um, life as we know it is starting to take shape, you know, then. So we know that Job was old like that because of a couple of internal clues in there. Uh, there's no mention of the law of Moses in Job at all. In fact, Job makes sacrifices for his family, he makes sacrifices for his friends. Uh, there's no mention of a priesthood, really. Uh, not, not a uh, Mosaic or Aaronic priesthood, anyway. Aaronic, not Aaronic uh, priesthood. Uh, at the very, very end of the book, it says that Job makes an inheritance for his daughters which would never have happened under Moses. That's, that's forbidden. If you have sons, the daughters don't get an inheritance. Uh, but before the law, they evidently they did. And uh, it seems that Job's wealth is measured in livestock. And you see that if you're following along the Genesis. Uh, Abraham and Isaac are very wealthy because they got a lot of sheep and goats and camels and, and uh, such things like that. So uh, wealth is measured in livestock. Uh, no mention of the law, daughters, and, and and things like that. So around the time of Abraham-ish, 
Uh, it's all pretty vague. Like even Jovian comes from the land of Uz, and that's vague. There's a, the ways to infer maybe where it's from. If we look up Job's friends, where they come from, there's a lot of inferences about about where it's from. But it's not really that important. He lived a long time ago uh, in some place, and he was wealthy, and really, really bad stuff happens to him. And we want to know why these things happen. So, I want to write a quote up here on the board. Uh, I think I think this is a this is pretty fantastic. It's a uh, total total three uh, said this. He didn't say it about Joe, but it did him as well. Um, formerly, I want to write this down so you can copy it because I've been thinking about this a lot. Men uh, were miserable. Formerly, if men were miserable, they went to church. Okay. They went to church uh, so as to find the rationale. Formerly, if men were miserable, they went to church so as to find the rationale for their misery. Semicolon. They did not expect to be happy. Alright? Formerly, if men were miserable, they went to church so as to find the rationale for their misery. They did not expect to be happy. This idea is Greek. Not Christian or Jewish. <clears throat> Formerly, if men were miserable, they went to church so as to find the rationale for their misery. They did not expect to be happy. This idea is Greek, not Christian or Jewish. And Philip Reef said that um, I don't know, 60 years ago or something. I think that's important because as we read Job, Job asks all kinds of questions. Well, actually, he asks one question: Why? Um, he doesn't request for it all to be put right. He doesn't say God fix it. He doesn't say God make me feel better. He just says, "Why is this happening to me?" And that's it. Um, I'm going to give you a big spoiler alert: God does not answer him. He doesn't tell him why ever. And that's the whole question of the book. Why, why, why? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Why did you do this to me? And God doesn't answer. We don't get the answer. Why? Uh, I suspect it's a little bit like Moses says the secret things of the Lord. He will not inquire after those things, but I'm not sure. Uh, the book is um, broken up into four parts. Let's do this. So Job's got chapters one and two. As a sort of a prologue. That's where we find out that Job's a righteous man. He's one of the best guys in the you know in the world. He's uh, he loves God. He's got a good family. <laughs> Satan hates him. You know. Uh, we find that out in the prologue, uh, chapters three through thirty-seven. <coughs> That's um, exchanges with his friends. Let's say uh, a series of speeches. Speeches and prayers. That's where uh, Job talks to his friends and they talk to him and it gets very contentious um, at parts. Eventually, God responds. And then uh, in chapter 42, we get an epilogue. Okay. It's real, it's real nice. 
nice um, moments and um, simple there. So, <coughs> Job is, a, is righteous. He, he does everything right so far as so far as we can tell. There's nothing obviously wrong with him. He's not an evil guy at all. Um, his children were not evil. Just, growing up, though, I always kind of assumed they were really bad. You know, like they were having drunken revelries and orgies and everything like that. It's probably just because it said they were drinking wine. And that was enough for me. I was like, oh, these guys are horrible sinners. Uh, it doesn't seem to be that way, though. Uh, because uh, Job sacrifices for them because he says, perhaps they have secretly sinned in their hearts. <laughs> There was nothing external going on for him to say, these are guys are wild sinners, I'm going to sacrifice one. He's just like, I don't know, maybe they do something secretly. I'm going to go ahead and try to cover for stuff that I can't see on the outside. So it's got to be a family. In fact, they, they have regular family dinners. <laughs> that was a different way of looking at it. I, when I'm reading the fathers commenting on this, they said they were in the habit of meeting together because they were a good family. You know, they had family meals together. Um, so Job's living a good life. He's very wealthy. He's well respected. Uh, he pretty much has everything: good family, good, good job, good position, uh, good reputation. And uh, Satan presents himself uh, before God with all the rest of the sons of God. Like you got the scene in heaven. There's this room, and everyone is. Uh, it's like a. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's all the sons of God present themselves before God. It's like a. Uh, a meeting, you know, like a, a very big stand-up meeting, I suppose. And um, Satan is there, the accuser, this is what Satan is, he accuses the righteous before God. And um, he really hates Job, because God says to Satan, he says, if you can, where have you been? He said, going up, up and down, walking up and down all through the earth. And he says, well, did you see Job? He's a really, he's my servant Job. Um, the, the fathers, as I'm reading it, don't think this really happened. They think it's more metaphorical. They don't think Satan would ever present himself before God and God just knew Satan's heart. But, you know, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and Satan says to God, he says, well, the only reason he's a good servant is because you've given him everything. You've blessed everything that he's done. Uh, he's got an easy life, great family. You take all that stuff away from him, he's going to hate you. You know, the only reason he loves you is because things are going pretty good for him right now. And uh, for whatever reason, God says, okay, you can take away all of this stuff. Just don't touch it at all. Now, and then this is where the action of the story happens. Um, Satan makes some uh, assumptions. And uh, he, he assumes that Job only obeys and is only righteous because he's gaining from it. He, this is what he gets out of it. You know, you obey God, you get riches. You're righteous, you get happiness. It's a pretty good transaction that works out that way. Satan assumes that's what's going on. And uh, he says, if you take away the rewards, if you stop this paycheck, he's going to stop working for you. And God says, okay, uh, we'll see if that's true. Um, so uh, Satan goes and takes away all those livestock. You see that uh, as he takes things away and the messengers come one right after the other to Job, um, we've got livestock are destroyed, children are destroyed, and then eventually Job's health is destroyed, and then the very last thing that turns against him is his own life. It's like things start far off, you know, your goats and your sheep are taken. Okay, that's pretty bad. Okay, now my, you know, my food is gone. Now my children are gone. That's terrible. You know, now I don't even have my health at all, and now the very person who's supposed to be in one flesh with me has turned against me uh, and wants me to die. Uh, tells me to curse God and die. So, uh, Job is uh, Job's in a bad spot. And so he asks God why. He says, why? Um, and is God just? I guess he's asking two questions here. So, yeah, the, the big giant question here is, we can't make this one too big. Because we ask this one all the time. Why me? Why did the righteous suffer? Why, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Sort of a thing. Why? And... Is God just? If all of these things have happened to me and I haven't done anything wrong, why am I being punished? Why am I experiencing bad things? That's not fair. It's not right. 
So there's some assumptions, I think, that are uh, taking place here. And I think that Job's friends take these assumptions too. So when Job's friends, I guess friends should be really heavy here. Well, I'm scared. Friends. Um, when they come, I, I love some of Job's responses to his friends. He goes, like, oh, surely when you die, all wisdom will go with you. You know, you guys are so smart. You know, but essentially, with friends like you, who needs, you know, who needs that um, Some comforters you guys are. So everyone is, is uh, more or less making the same... Uh, everyone is more or less making the same assumption. So the us uh, the assumption. This is one where you just assume. This is not the the controversial one where Mary goes up, you know. And <laughs> no, the, the assumption. No. <laughs> see, I want to make sure I write I write this right. Um, The assumption is, I want to make sure I, I put this up right because I think it's pretty good. Our action <coughs> and uh, God's justice. Okay. So our action is if we are wise and good, that um, we will have success and rewards. Okay, if we are foolish and evil, <clears throat> if we're foolish and evil, there's disaster and punishment. <clears throat> Sounds pretty good, right? We're wise and good, we'll be successful and rewarded. If we're foolish and evil, disaster and punishment follow right after that. That's what most of the book is found is found um, is based on. Job more or less believes this, at least at first. Uh, Job's friends absolutely believe this, and Satan believes it too. So everyone believes this. Uh, in fact, the, uh, Job's friends believe this to the point where they see that disaster has come on Job. Therefore, he must have done something wicked. And he says, I have not done anything wicked. And they say, well, only you know how many lies you're telling to us. Uh, there's no way we could discover all of the lies that you're telling now. You've obviously done wicked things. How on earth could you accuse God of doing these things to you if you've not done wicked things? And Job says, no, I did not do these things. <clears throat> um, there's a deeper assumption here, though. Right, so this is like the, the surface assumption. This is the presenting assumption. Uh, the actual assumption under it, the deeper assumption, is we have the perspective to know. So even if this were true, we're just assuming, well, I see enough to know whether or not that this is all going right. And if you have children at all, and they ask you, can we do such as, it's a Saturday, let's go to the beach today. Can we go to the beach? No, we can't go today. Why not? It's a great day. I don't have anything to do. I would like to go to the beach, whereas you've got you know, your pool pump doesn't work, you gotta replace the headlight in your van, the washing machine is on, you know, and you've only got one day to take care of all this. They don't see any of that stuff. They just see, I don't have anything to do, it's a cool day, it's a you know, beach day, let's go. And you say no, and they're like, oh, life is unfair. You know, why is this injustice visited upon me? What have I done, you know? <laughs> you lack perspective, kid. You, know, you don't see all ends. And, um, <laughs> It's a little more serious now with Job. He loses, you know, there's death and everything involved here. Um, <laughs> but I do think that this idea of perspective goes a long way in, in um, uh, explaining God's answer to Job that is, that is eventually going to come. 
I should say that this is the thing, even, even my, my students at school, <coughs> and it, it makes me crazy when I hear this. Job's friends uh, sort of believe in karma, you know, like uh, karma is a thoroughly Hindu idea. It is not Christian at all. Uh, they believe, yeah, you're going to get what you deserve. You know, you do bad stuff, bad stuff comes back to you. You do good stuff, good stuff comes back to you. They, they believe this. I, so I, I assume that uh, his friends would have really approved of the idea of karma. Uh, and just sort of as an aside, at the very end, God threatens to kill Job's friends. Like He says they've said everything wrong about me. Even though they spend the entire book trying to justify God and say, you know, Job, don't, don't say these things about God. That it's not right. He's the judge of all. And at the very end, God is angry enough he's ready to kill them all. Uh, and Job, who has said some truly terrible things about God, he says, Job has done right. Sacrifice for your friends so that I don't kill them. So, uh, God's not a big believer in karma. <laughs> so, um, Job is the, uh, the third book. We have three Three books in the Old Testament, um, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, that are generally considered the wisdom books. We're reading Proverbs right now, um, very small chunks at a time, <laughs> but we're you know, two chapters into it at this point. And uh, they're, they're three very different books. Proverbs, if you're paying attention, seems to be saying, it actually seems to be saying this a lot. You know, if you're wise and good, God will reward you. If, Avoid, don't go down into the arms of a strange woman. You know, there's disaster lays down that way. Attend to my voice, uh, oh my son. You know, be, seek wisdom, be wise, and, and things will be good. Then you read Ecclesiastes, and it says, why bother? It's your vain life. It doesn't matter. All is vanity, all is vexation of spirit. Why does it matter anyway? Do what you want to do. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's where it comes from. Uh, it's wildly pessimistic in, in some ways. So you have Proverbs saying this, Ecclesiastes says, eh, you know, maybe, maybe not. And then you have Job right there at the end saying, I've done this. I've been all of these things. I am have been righteous and I have done right. Bad things are happening to me anyway. So which one is it? It's Job seems to straddle the fence on, on both of those, on both of those things in an attempt, I think, to answer, to answer it. So when uh, Job, oh, let's see here. I mean, I don't want to say that yet. So when Job uh, is in the midst of all this, talking to his friends, you get some really, um, Great things like Job says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him, yet will I trust him, um, yet will I uh, argue my ways to his face, this will be my salvation. You know, he's saying very, very faithful things in the midst of it. And then at other times he's saying, oh, may the day that I was born be a curse. You know, would that I was stillborn and, you know, never saw the day. God is not just, he's not in charge. He, you know, if, uh, chapter 10 here, I think, is just about as I don't know, sometimes you hear people say things and you're like, I wouldn't stand next to that guy in a thunderstorm. <laughs> like, you know, that's about as... So, um, I will say, this is chapter 10. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend against me. Does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands and favor the designs of the wicked? Have you eyes of flesh? Do you see as a man sees? Are your days as the days of man? Or your years as a man's years, that you seek out my iniquity and search for my sin. Although you know that I am not guilty, and there is none to deliver out of your hand, your hands fashioned and made me, and now you have destroyed me altogether. Remember that you have made me like clay, and will you return me to the dust? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? You clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and steadfast love, and your care has preserved my spirit. So he goes from this beginning, like, do you have eyes? Can you even see what's going on at all? I mean, do you live years like that? No, it's, it's interesting. God, you can't sympathize with what I'm going through. Why are you doing this to me? You made me. Why are you breaking me apart at this point? 
And then the roller coaster will go back up and he'll say, oh, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And he just seems to be all over the place, which, you know, which is understandable, I think. Um, there's, yeah, I think, and then we get, we get some really great things. We still use these, we still say these men who was born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. We say things like that. So. Say it again. A uh, man who's born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Did you say, you say that in the... We think you've lo we lost your mic. Oh, is my mic on? It went off a while ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, Job is saying all of these things. Some of them are very, very hard things. Things that I would not say to God, like if you've ever read some of the some of the psalms, there's always the uh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's like some of the psalms. A lot of the psalms are, I'm very angry. Yeah. God, you've forgotten me. Um, I go to bed crying every night. I water my bed with tears. Uh, that's a lot of the psalms. And you think, oh, that's not very praise song. You know, that's not uh, hill song. But that right. <laughs> but God approves of these. He approves of these. He puts them in the Bible so that we pray these terrible things back to him. Um, I think that uh, it, it's hard to understand these things. And uh, I, I heard Tim Keller uh, quote, I just I heard this past week actually. Tim Keller was talking about an Old Testament professor of his. Tim Keller was a, a he just died this year, but he was a, he was a very famous uh, Presbyterian pastor in New York. He said, uh, Job says these awful things, absolutely terrible things. But God approves of it. Why does God approve of these terrible things that Job says? And he says it's because Job said them in prayer. That's why. It's okay. You know, God was not afraid of Job's anger. He wasn't afraid of his disappointment. He's, Job said it in the proper way. You know, so when you read the Psalms and they're full of all of this doubt and heartbreak and heartache and um, wondering if God is even real, they're all said in the form of a prayer to God himself so that's okay that's good uh, whereas Job's friends you know maybe coming from a place of pride or, or somewhere like that they actually said things that are pretty true you know that for the most part they're, they're not bad things that they said but they said them in the in the wrong way you know there's a there's this idea <clears throat> I don't know if maybe Karl Barth said this about what is the word of God uh, he says that when Satan comes to Jesus and he quotes scripture to Jesus, is that also the word of God? And he says, absolutely not. Not when Satan is quoting it, it is not. Even though it's the exact quote from the Bible, that's no longer the word of God because of where it came from. Uh, it came from a, a place of temptation and trying to move Jesus, trying to move, tempting Jesus to sin. That's no longer the word of God. So I wonder if even though a lot of what Job's friends say are, you know, not bad, you know, it's kind of true in a, in a Proverbs kind of a kind of a way. They're true, but they're coming from the wrong place. So God does not approve of them. The things that God uh, that Job says about God being unjust and not being controlled, these are not true. They're not bad, but they're coming from the right place and directed to the right way so God accepts them. I hope that's okay to say. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, it's like a yeah. pleading okay. versus a condemning. Like you're... Job's pleading with God, like, help me understand this, because this is not what I should be thinking about you. Yes. Where his friends are like, this is obviously true about God, in a more of a condemning way. Yes. Versus Job is pleading, like, help me understand, which is where the songs are, too, yes. right? It's this plea of, like, I don't understand what's going on. And often those songs are resolved at the end and come back to, right. but I will praise you, but I right. will trust you. Um, and that seems to be the kind of underlying difference is the plea versus the condemnation. Yes, I, I think that's true. You do, you all heard that. It's, yeah, it's the plea versus condemnation, or it's the, the plea versus a, just a gripe, you know, just griping. You never expect it to be resolved. You're just griping because you're angry. Yeah, Psalm 22 is a great one. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Read the, the rest of the psalm. It ends up with faithfulness. You know, I, I, the Lord is faithful. Um, 
Job even says to his wife in the beginning, he says that uh, we accept good things from God. Why don't we accept evil things? God doesn't owe us anything at all. I think that one's pretty much an important one to remember as well. Um, we're perfectly happy to accept good things. We are, we are not uh, happy to accept the bad things, although God doesn't have any obligations one way or the other to us. So Job essentially says, if I only ever received evil only, it still would be okay. That's not unjust of God to do. So um, essentially, um, I think maybe the key, or part of the key of the book, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's, yeah, that's, that's kind of hard, but I, I think that may be true. So eventually, God does answer Job after a fashion. Uh, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action, gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. So God eventually does answer, but then his answer is two chapters, three chapters of, do you know where ice comes from? Yes. Do you make the sunrise and the sunset? Where do the mountain goats give birth? How long are they pregnant? Who feeds them? What about the ravens? Where do they get their food? You know so much. Who's taking care of the stars in the sky? <laughs> and Job, you know, eventually he just very, very humble, and he just says, I've spoken, and I won't speak again. You're right. I'm sorry. <clears throat> God is essentially saying, the washing machine is on the fritz. I've got to replace the headlight in the van. The pool pump doesn't work. The lawn needs to be mowed. You can't go to the beach today, and you don't need to know why. You're not taking care of everything. I'm taking care of everything, and you can't see all ends at all. Uh, I, I think that this is, this is, uh, Job is, is flirting with uh, despair. The, the sin of despair is that you know all ends from the be from where you are, and they're all evil. That's despair, and it's a great, it's actually a great sin. Uh, it's one of the worst ones, and a lot of people don't uh, don't get out of it. It kills people. Despair does. And uh, God is essentially saying, "Don't despair because you don't see all ends. You don't know everything that's going on at all, and I don't owe you any explanations." And, <clears throat> I was told once, <clears throat> when I was going through my own tribulations, I was told this by a priest, that God purifies you when he puts you through trial, like the goldsmith who goes into the fire to purify and get rid of the impurities. Yeah, you're, you're being purged. Right, yes, that is, that is correct. So, um, I... I know we're a big tent here. Some of, some here believe in a real, honest to goodness purgatory. Others more of a metaphorical one. I'm just going to tell you, I'm a metaphorical kind of a guy. So if you if you're reading uh, the Divine Comedy, there's hell, purgatory, and heaven, inferno, purgatorio, paradiso. So I think purgatory is the best one because it's our life right now. You are being purged of your sins right now. And so if you read all of Dante's different punishments designed to contrapasso. They're, they're designed to purge people of their sins. You know, I don't know. Uh, sometimes do we suffer for no reason? I, you know, I don't know if we do or not. Sometimes we suffer for reasons. Sometimes we are actually getting natural consequences. You know, I, I decide, hey, that fentanyl stuff sounds like a great idea. I'm going to try it. It's very foolish, you know. And so I'm going to have disaster and punishment because it's, you know, I made some dumb choices. Um, but yeah, certainly the things that happen to us purge us. There's a, there's a scene in uh, a scene. St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi, at the end of his life, he's supposed to have received the stigmata, right? The, the wounds of Christ in his flesh. He's lived a life of asceticism. He's denied him self-denial, you know, uh, giving everything that he has away, a life of poverty. And at the very end of his life, his reward is he gets the wounds of Christ, which bleed and hurt. It's painful for him, and that's his reward. The pain is the grace that he gets. It's not, he doesn't get grace in spite of the pain, or because he took the pain, he gets the grace. The pain is the grace that he gets. For Mindy, I think, for the reason that you're saying, because it's, it purges, right? It changes us. I think that pain, and, and I think all of these things that Job went through changed him, for sure. 
Um, and I, I think they can change you if you if you accept your your suffering uh, faithfully. I think that it can change you for the better. I think that Job must be in story form. Uh, Philippians four twelve. Uh, Philippians four twelve says uh, the apostle Paul says I know both now uh, I both I I know both how to be abased and how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instruct I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul's happy whether he's got enough or he doesn't have enough. It doesn't matter. He's, his joy is not dependent on those things. Um, and I, I think that's where Job is coming from. I think that's what uh, the book of Job is trying to tell us. That um, the things that happen, it's, it's, a, it's a real temptation. I found a real temptation. Bad things happen in your life. What have I done wrong to deserve this punishment? And that's that's just not a Christian. It's not a Jewish question. It's not a Christian question to ask. Uh, you may, yeah, if you are that guy who decided to, you know, try, I'm going to try out adultery and see what it's like. Yeah, okay, maybe, you know, look back on those things and say, this is causing me some real punishment. But if, if you're faithful, you know, and terrible things are happening to you, don't just assume that you've done some horrible thing wrong. You don't know all the ends. You don't know why they're happening. But you can trust that God is, is faithful in the long run. Uh, in Job's case, he got everything back. He got lots more children. He got all of his stuff back. But I, I think the temptation is for us to read that as a, a, a reward for Job of being faithful. It's not. It's not a reward for him being faithful. If Job died on that ash pile with the boils all over him, that still would have been just. But it's just a gift. What, what uh, Job got in the beginning was a gift, and what he gets at the end is a gift. And uh, I guess to tie it back to St. Francis, he thought the same thing. He thought that by having nothing, everything that he had was a gift. So by owning nothing, he owned everything in that sense. So he felt, he felt um, that God was constantly providing for him, and he was constantly being uh, receiving gifts. So, Father Kevin. Would you say then that sanctification is the gradual change of our perspective? I think it at least incorporates the change of our perspective, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I also would like to have gone to the beach yesterday, but <laughs> I would still wasn't happy about it, but I had a better perspective than Jesus, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered, right? He was, a, he was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with suffering. He didn't do anything wrong at all. Think about that. Yeah, next, time, uh, next time this question comes to you, think about Jesus learning obedience through what he suffered. And a, a servant's not greater than his master. So you can expect the same thing. <laughs> That's, yeah, Janet. Uh, well, I think this is also why we teach our children logic and what can follow from what. Um, because when we do have those that surface assumption, there's a temporal nature to what we want that to be, right? If, if I make wise and good choices, then there's success and reward. Ultimately, yes. Ultimately, to, like, it might not be right now, but ultimately, yes. But we teach our children logic so that they don't fall into the, if I have success and reward, then it must mean that I was wise and good, right? right? Because our, our mind wants that to be true, but it's not. No. And um, and that's part of the reason why we want to teach our children logic, so they don't fall into that trap of, if there's disaster and punishment, it must have meant, that's what his friends were doing, right? It's a, it's a logical 
the logical fallacy that even if we believe if we're foolish and evil, we all have disaster and punishment, it doesn't translate to the other way around logically. Um, it doesn't work. No. Is Job a prototype of Jesus? Sure. Yes. It, yeah, yeah. You'll notice in the beginning when all of these terrible things happen, there's the, the little sign, and all of this Job did not sin. And then even more when his when his wife turns against him and says, I don't know about I don't know if the, I, I want to read into this, I really do, but I don't know if I should. It says, In all of this Job did not sin with his lips. You know, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it was inside, but yeah, uh, yeah, certainly the patience of Job. Job endures uh, endures suffering for sure, like like Jesus did without sinning, and he does cry out. Jesus cries, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Even though he cries out very faithfully, because read all of Psalm twenty two, and that that's a wonderfully um, reverent psalm. I think I will let everybody go. All right, thank you. Next week we'll finish up Genesis. I promise, half the book in uh, 45 minutes. <laughs>